Hi, I'm Pastor Peter Roselli from King of Kings Worship Center in Baskin Ridge, New Jersey. And I'm really happy you're joining to listen to this CD and kind of welcome you on this journey that we're going to take together for sanctification and transformation. We've learned a few things over the years about this material, and one thing that we learned is that it's good not to take it alone. If there's any way you can take the class with a friend or a spouse, we found that to be very helpful. Just have other people that you can speak with about the class and about what Holy Spirit is bringing up to your remembrance and the revelation he's given you on different things that we cover. We also encourage you to keep a journal and take good notes of the things that the Lord has shown you along the way. I often have compared it to connecting the dots. Remember that game that you played when you were a little child when you would see just a bunch of dots and numbers on a page and you'd have to connect them. Well, many times Holy Spirit will be giving you clues as we go through different topics and those clues end up being connected as you go. But you don't always know what those clues are along the way. You don't see how they fit into the big picture. But when you journal, that's it's one way to really help put those pieces together. Many times people have told us how they'll get memories or they'll have dreams or pictures will come up in, in their mind and prophetic words that they'll be given of things that don't always seem related, but then in the bigger picture later, uh, it, it makes sense. So again, just if you can... Keep a pad and paper nearby. If you're listening to these CDs in the car, I've always kept a pad and pen in my car so I can pull over and write things down that the Lord is showing me. Uh, you may or may not know this uh, material that we're covering is from John and Paula Sanford, who are the founders of Elijah House Ministry. John and Paul are now in their 80s as I record this in uh, the year 2011, and they're not really in active ministry anymore, but they have been a tremendous blessing to the body of Christ they served as pastors for 12 years and then opened up Elijah House, uh, which was a prayer ministry designed to assist people in overcoming obstacles, removing constraints in their lives, and helping with past traumas that were affecting present situations. And uh, many Christians haven't really had a good grounding, a biblical grounding in understanding that. They've written many books based on decades of experience in both the pulpit and in prayer ministry. They're helping people get free from destructive behavior patterns. They help people recognize what kind of trauma they've experienced in their lives and how abuse in the past might be contributing to a present-day problem. And then the Bible's big about the concept of strongholds. We want to help expose strongholds that have held people back from the growth and the maturity that God wants them to have. So one of the ways we describe the class is like a Holy Spirit CAT scan that looks for those hidden obstacles that have been slowing us down and preventing our progress of growth in the Lord. You know from the famous verse in Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a plan for us. It says specifically, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you hope in a future. We're determined right here with this class that we're going to help you fulfill your calling and you're going to do what it says in Philippians 3, 14, press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. To get to that prize, you've got to use all elements of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Word of God gives us the building blocks that we need, Scripture, the truth, to help offset the lies. Holy Spirit's going to come in and give guidance and revelation and remind you of things that have happened in your life and remind you of what Scripture says. Jesus is the model. He's our example. He's the one that came and lived among us and set the example for the perfect human being, and then the Father, being the good Father that He is, is always providing that unconditional love and acceptance and speaking the truth over who we are as His sons and His daughters to counter the lie of the accuser of the brethren. We believe that God honors character over gifting, and He wants a powerful church. And in order to have a powerful church, He needs Christians, and especially the leaders, to be walking in godly character, not allowing open doors to sin in their lives, even though they could be very gifted Gifts of the Spirit are wonderful, but God values the character over the gifting. As wonderful as the gifts are, you put powerful spiritual gifts in the hands of an immature believer, and that can be a recipe for disaster. So the end goal of the class is to have meat-eating Christians, not milk drinkers, mature people who have looked inside as well as into the Word and seen if there's any areas in their hearts that have been holding them back and that want to move forward and overcome those obstacles Really, it's a matter of a death process, bringing those things to the cross and dying, and then having God resurrect that new creation on the other side of the cross. So the goal of the class is to submit to a process. You'll hear it often, sanctification and transformation. 
This is a process of sanctification and transformation so God can dismantle old counterfeit structures and build in us that godly character that we need to achieve our destiny and for the church to achieve its destiny as a powerful force in the earth. If you've been dealing with issues in your life that you feel have been holding you back, not reaching that full potential that you have in God, we can tell you with confidence that God has the power to bring change and transformation into your life. One of the ways he does it through Holy Spirit is reveal those root causes that are acting as deterrents for you now as an adult. And then gives us tools like prayer and repentance, confession, forgiveness, all those aspects of our normal Christian life. You know what it says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us, cleanse us from all the iniquity and attachments that really have been a root system in our lives. Those sins typically on the surface are traced back to some kind of root. And where there's fruit, we say there's a root. We want God to expose that and then help us get that root out. Once the root's gone and all its attachments and the bad fruit that comes with it, could be an anger problem, could be sexual issues that you're dealing with, whatever that fruit is, once the root is gone, the fruit disappears. We can think of the scriptural phrase, possessing your vessel in honor, which is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'll start with verse 3. Verse 3 says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one should take advantage of and defraud his brother in this matter, because the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also forewarned you and testified. For God did not call us to uncleanness, but in holiness. So if you just think back on those verses, that's the point. His purpose for our lives is sanctification, which can be translated as the process of taking an unholy thing and bringing it into holiness. That's what he wants for us. Another scripture that we can think about with Elijah House implications is 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. The key phrase there is that we are being transformed. Yes, when you got saved, you were converted from an unbeliever and a pagan into a believer. Yes, if you happen to die that particular night after you said yes to the Lord, you would go to heaven. You're a believer. But yes, we could also say we're being transformed even after the cross, after salvation. We're being transformed into something. This verse says we're being transformed into his likeness. We're being transformed into Christ's likeness. And then the real kicker is it's with ever-increasing glory. So this isn't what the world offers, which is diminishing returns. When you come into relationship with Christ and you submit yourself to this process of growth, sanctification, transformation, it gets better as time goes by. In the world, the more people do things, the more it diminishes in its returns. In Christ, the more you do it, the better it gets. We are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory. And that truth lets us know that we're on a journey. It's a process. We don't have to think we have to rush this thing. So on top of those two foundational pillars of sanctification and transformation, we lay supporting concepts. The first one I want to bring to you is from Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. That's such a key principle for so many of the topics we'll be talking about because the lack of honoring our parents has opened the door to sin, and because of that sin, it brings death. Doesn't mean that our parents are always honorable, and this is not a conditional kind of promise. It doesn't say honor your father and mother when they're honorable. It says honor them so that life may go well with you. How that translates is as we're going through these different topics, you'll think of things that your parents didn't do well, and it would be easy to shift into a blame mode. That's the easy temptation. It's their fault. The reason my life is messed up is because my parents dropped the ball. What we have to do instead is believe 1 Corinthians 13, 7. I'm going to read from the Amplified Bible. It says, love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. That's what we have to think about our parents. So the first core principle, honor your mother and father, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. The second key principle on top of sanctification and transformation is that we cannot control what other people do to us. 
or what they've done to us in the past, but we can't control our response. And that plays itself out many times, right? So your parents didn't do right in, in a certain area. We can't go back and change that, but we now have the ability to control our response to that. We can either stay angry and we can dig in and be resentful about it, or we can choose to forgive them, bless them, believe the best that they did the best they could with what they had and move on. The third one is a common scriptural principle of sowing and reaping. I won't go into a lot of detail on it now. I just want you to remember it as a pillar and a foundational principle here is that as we sow, so shall we reap. In Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, do not judge for the same measure you judge. It will be measured back to you. So many times the bad fruit that we are experiencing now is just a result of having planted seeds in the past. And we want that process to stop. All right, the fourth principle Romans chapter 8, verse 28, many of us know it by heart. God will make all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. God will cause the bad things that happened in our lives in the past to actually work together for our good today. You're going to take that one on faith right now, but I believe over the course of the next 12 classes that we take together, you'll see how true that verse is. Think of Isaiah 61. God sent me to announce the year of his grace. This is from the Message Bible. A celebration of God's destruction of our enemies, to comfort all who mourn, to care for the needs of all who mourn in Zion, to give them bouquets of roses instead of ashes, messages of joy instead of news of doom, a praising heart instead of a languid spirit. Rename them oaks of righteousness planted by God to display his glory. So God is in the business of restoring. Bad things have happened to all of us. We don't have to hit the erase button and pretend they never happened or live in regret and wish we had lived a different life. He'll actually take the broken things and make them work together for good. And then the fifth one that I want to spend a minute on is that we are held as leaders in the church and people involved in ministry, just regular old members of the body of Christ, regardless of your title. We're held to a high level of accountability. and We've got to care for the flock. God loves his church. He said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. That's both the local church and the overall body of Christ. I'm going to take a minute to read from Ezekiel chapter 34. It says, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the Lord says. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat the curds. You clothe yourselves with wool and slaughter the choice animals, but you do not take care of the flock. You've not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. You've ruled them harshly and brutally. So they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And when they were scattered, they became food for all the wild animals. My sheep wandered over all the mountains, and on every high hill they were scattered over the whole earth, and no one searched or looked for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As surely as I live, declares the sovereign Lord, because my flock lacks a shepherd and has been plundered and has become food for all the wild animals, and because my shepherds did not search for my flock but cared for themselves rather than for my flock, Therefore, O shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I'm against the shepherds and will hold them accountable for my flock. I'll remove them from tending the flock so that the shepherds can no longer feed themselves. I'll rescue my flock from their mouths and it will no longer be food for them. That is a strong word from the Lord in Ezekiel. And you may say, well, I'm not a pastor. I don't have a title. I'm not an elder. That's not the point. The point is that we're all part of the body of Christ, that we're all ministers, that he's equipped us for the work of the ministry, and that we have an accountability. We can't just look past hurting people. We were those hurting people when we walked in the front door of the church or wherever it was that you came out of darkness and into the light of God. And that we have to have a heart of compassion on people, all people, from top to bottom, however you measure top and however you measure bottom, from, from the ones who appear to be the most successful to the ones who are hurting, we have an accountability to God to minister to everybody. The Bible says, be careful. You might be ministering to an angel unaware. That hurting person that God puts in your path might not be a person. It might be an angel. It might be a test. We've got to live our lives under that understanding that we're being held to a very high accountability 
Just to review real quickly, the first one I said was honor your mother and father. Second one, you can't control what people do to you, but you can control your response. The third one was the law of sowing and reaping, that today we might be experiencing pain based on things that were sown many years ago and now we're reaping. That process can be reversed. The fourth one was Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for good. Even the bad stuff, God will make it work together. And then the fifth one was that as leaders, we're held to a higher standard of accountability to God. And even if you don't have the title of a leader, God is counting you as a minister. So I'm going to quote from John Sanford's book called Transforming the Inner Man from the Introduction. He says, what's been missing from the church during the present great outpouring of God's spirit is a proper theology and understanding of how believers' hearts are to be sanctified after being born anew. Wondrous giftings are elevating many into prominence. All of that is good and to be celebrated, but too many rising leaders are falling, some to immorality, others to pressures in their families, pressures in organizations. Throughout church history, disciplines and practices for sanctification and transformation have been developed. Believers knew their conversion did not end the process of change. It began the process of change. But that wisdom has largely been lost to our present generation. The prevalence of that truncated theology has meant that leaders being raised up today have largely remained unaware of the necessity of bringing their fleshly practices to death on the cross after being born anew. Failure to deal with our root structures has led us to an ineffective, low-voltage version of Christianity that's not creating the cultural transformation that God desires. We end up with a prophetic disconnect. We have people who are very gifted, discerning, knowledgeable of the Word, but they're not walking out the basics of the fruits of the Spirit, kindness and patience, compassion, just being consistent in their walk, which in a word can be summarized as just maturity. We want both. You know how Paul described it in Romans 7. I'll read from the Message Bible. He said, What I don't understand about myself is that I decide one way, but then I act another, doing things I absolutely despise. So if I can't be trusted to figure out what is best for myself and then do it, it becomes obvious that God's command is necessary. But I need something more. For if I know the law but still can't keep it, And if the power of sin within me keeps sabotaging my best intentions, I obviously need help. I realize I don't have what it takes. I can will it, but I can't do it. Verse 19 of Romans 7, I decide to do good, but I don't really do it. I decide not to do bad, but then I do it anyway. Verse 20, my decisions such as they are don't result in actions. Something has gone wrong deep within me and gets the better of me every time. It happens so regularly that it's predictable. The moment I decide to do good, sin is there to trip me up. Verse 22, I truly delight in God's command, but it's pretty obvious that not all of me joins in that delight. Parts of me covertly rebel, and just when I least expect it, they take charge. I've tried everything, and nothing helps. I'm at the end of my rope. Is there no one who can do anything for me? Isn't that the real question? Verse 25, the answer, thank God, is that Jesus Christ can and does. That's the point we want to make here, is that Jesus Christ can and does do something about that. That struggle that we all experience where we know what we should do, but don't end up doing it. God has revealed to us that there are root systems and structures, agreements with lies, inner vows, all kinds of baggage that you'll hear us talking about. Even on the other side of the cross, even after being saved, we carry some of these things in with us. It's like an onion being peeled. You peel back the layers, you get to the root, you pull that root out, and all that bad fruit goes away. It's a wonderful, wonderful process of freedom. Although I have to say, it's not always a pleasant process. So back to quoting from the introduction to Transforming the Inner Man. John says, A proper doctrine and practice of sanctification and transformation have been lost to the modern church. That's perhaps the greatest reason so many leaders today are falling. This book, Transforming the Inner Man, is the first of four in a series, and it intends to fill that gap. We will reveal what are many of the practices in the flesh that need to be brought under the salutary effects of confession, repentance, death on the cross, and rebirth into the new, even after conversion. We will teach how to recognize habits that may have died positionally when we received Jesus, but have sprung back to life to defile many. 
And the scripture for that principle is from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, where it says, Pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking carefully, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. So the principle there, yes, you got saved. Yes, you're a new creation in Christ. But old things still spring up from the inside until the root systems are dealt with. Quoting again from the introduction, we want to fervently reveal how the horrible events of our lives are not totally waste and loss, but the very ground of wisdom out of which we will be able to minister to others. Because our Lord suffered and was tempted, he's able to minister to those who suffer and are tempted. That's a quote from Hebrews 2, verse 18. But the same is also true of us. Transformation means that Satan has won no victories whatsoever in our lives. This book and the three to follow are designed to make Romans 8.28. God will make all things work together for good to those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Make that Romans 8.28 a reality in our lives. That all things do work together for good to those who are called according to his purpose. Total transformation is for every believer, but the process is not easy. It will require continual death and rebirth. For many years, Paula Sanford and I, John says, have been prayer ministers pioneering the field of inner healing. We prefer the term prayer minister to counselor because our approach is based on biblical principles of prayer rather than psychology. While we do employ some psychological insights, we only do so when those agree with scriptural principles. The Lord has opened our eyes to understand that there is a vast difference between specific sins and the hidden sinful practices in the flesh that lie at their roots. Sins need to be forgiven, but our flesh, which gives birth to the sins, can only be dealt with by our own death on the cross. Forgiveness is done solely for us by Jesus, but death on the cross requires our participation. It isn't enough to pray for forgiveness, but then fail to call the flesh to death on the cross. Nor is it enough to daily die to self on the cross, repenting for that sinful behavior, unless we are aware of how to reach to the heart to accomplish death and rebirth where those sinful practices and behavior were formed. Total transformation of our hearts cannot be fully realized until we lay the ax to the roots. Roots lie hidden beneath the surface. I believe the greatest lack of the church is in not knowing how to transform our hearts at the deep level of causes dealing with sins and inclination towards sin. Without dealing at the level of roots, true sanctification and transformation cannot be fully accomplished in the body of Christ. We must comprehend that the full vision of inner transformation can only be accomplished by continual death and rebirth. God does not want only to restore men to the abundant life that he describes in John chapter 10, verse 10, When he said, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I've come to give you life and give it more abundantly. He doesn't want to just restore men to that abundant life. He also wants to raise perfected sons and daughters. In this book, I want to help you understand that transformation will require more than just accepting Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to help you learn to apply the cross of Christ through prayer and counsel to sinful structures built into your heart over a lifetime. Because although every sinful deed was fully washed away when you accepted Christ as your Lord, not every part of your heart was immediately able to fully appropriate the good news of that fact. So not quoting from the book, now it's just me speaking as a pastor. I can tell you that many people that were raised in the church were taught from the pulpit that nothing in your past matters anymore because once you're saved, quoting the Bible again, any man's in Christ, he's a new creation, old things have passed away, all things have become new. I hope to point out to you over the course of this course that as wonderful as that verse is and as true as it is, that God brings new creation. There are still things that need to be dealt with on this side of the cross, and it's really because he loves us that he does that. John says in the testimony that he gives in the introduction to transforming the inner man, he says, I was to see that Holy Spirit does not intend to improve us or make us better and better. He intends to bring us to fullness of death and make us new. I learned also that transforming the inner man does not once and for all fully reform our flesh, this side of physical death, but rather it slays the power of our flesh to control us while clothing us with the righteousness of Jesus. 
True healing comes then not by making a broken thing good enough to work, but by delivering us from the power of that broken thing so that it can no longer rule us, and by teaching us to trust his righteousness to shine in and through that very broken thing. And here's where the biblical method and the Christian form of restoration and transformation is different from the world system. He would then go on to quote about psychology, those who heal by restoring the self-image, psychologists, cause people to trust in something repaired in the flesh, merely reshape in that old carnal practice, which sooner or later dooms them to failure. Whereas the Lord heals by leaving the broken part right there in place, but overcoming it by his nature. Our trust as Christians can only be in his righteousness in us and for us. We'd like to feel, after all, in our hearts that we're pretty good people. To be sure, we did some awful things, but Jesus paid the price for that, and now we can be the good guys that God created us to be. But sorry, folks, that's not the way it is. You can't peel it off and get down to the good. The whole thing got infected by sin, and now it's leave it there and put on Christ, which is a quote from Colossians 3. That's how we have the new nature, by wearing it, by putting it on. What the church has lacked is day-to-day death and rebirth in Christ. We have smugly sung that death and rebirth have been accomplished when really the process has only begun. The very saint, the Apostle Paul, who wrote that salvation is a free gift, not of works, in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, also wrote in Philippians 2, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The blood of Jesus washes away sins and the cross redeems and justifies and atones. Resurrection restores and gives new life, but it's that personal daily taking up of our own cross that continues the necessary slaughter of the old man. Only as that daily work of continuing sanctification happens to the fullest does the mature man of faith appear, whether that can be an individual or the corporate body of Christ. All of this is summed up beautifully in Ephesians chapter 4, starting with verse 13. Paul said, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, perfect there not meaning flawless, it means complete or mature, to the measure of stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up, again, may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love." Every part does its share. People walk in the church hurting. They've had trauma in their lives. They say yes to Christ, but there are still many areas in their lives that need wholeness and healing and just to recover from the wounds that they've experienced. This says the effective working by which every part does its share. We believe that through this process of sanctification and transformation, every believer can be transformed and take their place on the wall. As it says in Nehemiah, all the people got together and they had a mind to work Same people, when Nehemiah got there, they were discouraged. It just took one apostolic anointed figure to come in and motivate people to take their place on the wall. And they got that wall built and they held back the enemy. And that's a picture of the church, the healthy church of Jesus Christ today, the one which the gates of hell will not prevail against. So back to a quote from John in the introduction to Transforming the Inner Man. He says, from birth on, each of us is trying to build a self that we can accept. That's prior to our salvation. It's the same striving, no matter whether we want to be like God or whether we want to be gentle and good or whether, like Hitler, he wanted to be powerful but evil. The attempt is to build a character structure that works the way we want it to. All too many Christians, without being aware of it, are still trying to use the Lord to build that good self. Their prayers and their deeds are to that end. But that's not the Lord's design. He does not want us to build a successful self. That whole search to build something we can accept and rest in is the very thing that was supposed to have died on the cross. Continuing to try to build our self 
is actually based on flight from accepting what we are. As though if we could just build something powerful or lovely enough, we might come to peace about ourselves and forget the search to overcome the hidden rottenness in our core. But the simple good news is that the search is already ended. We are already accepted right where we are and right as we are. The Lord's love is unconditional. He will build us. We don't have to build ourselves. Matthew 60, 24 says, If anyone wishes to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. C.S. Lewis said it this way in his book, The Great Divorce. Transformation celebrates that the lizard that rode our backs is the very thing that will become the noble steed to carry us to victory in the battle for others. So, transformed alcoholics minister best to alcoholics. Formerly depressed people know by their own desert experiences how to feed the downtrodden the only kind of manna that they can receive. Judgmental people have now become tender-hearted extenders of mercy. People with hearts of stone have now become warm hearts of flesh to melt wintry souls. Another point here, transformation is not synonymous with healing. The word healing seems to imply that something that formerly worked became broken, so we fix it. In our carnal thinking, which was formed in the world, healing may still mean restoring something that was formerly good to working order again, like a good car with some hidden flaw, which creates a malfunction until a mechanic discovers it and fixes it. That's fine. Good things need to be mended, but that analogy cannot be applied to the human soul. To the body, yes, our bodies are good and clean and washed by the blood of Jesus and often need to be mended, but no structure in our flesh is meant to be patched up and fixed. Every part is to be slain and reborn. The human soul is not in that sense to be mended. Think of Matthew 9, 16. No one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment and a worse tear results. Nor do men put new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. The inner being is not inclined toward moral goodness, that it should be restored. Romans 7:18 says, For I know that nothing good dwells in me that is in my flesh. The wishing is present in me, but the doing of the good is not. We find a similar scripture in Colossians chapter 3, where we hear about death and putting off and putting on. So Colossians 3, 5 says, Therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Notice it doesn't say fix those things. It says put to death your members which are on the earth. Then in verse 8, But now you yourselves are to put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. So there's a putting off. And then in verse 12, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So I think you get the picture all throughout Scripture. This concept keeps getting revalidated over and over again, that once we come to Christ, that begins a process of sanctification and transformation. I'll quote again from one of the books that John and Paula wrote called Transformation of the Inner Man, which is the first version. The one I've been quoting from is a new publication called Transforming the Inner Man. This goes back to the original version. He says, all sinful structures in our lives carry a reward system with them. So long as we prefer the rewards, we will not change. One time, I, John, kept trying and trying to not do a particular sin, praying about it over and over again only to find myself doing it again. Finally, I got mad at God, and I cried out, Why don't you help me with this? He answered quickly and succinctly, You aren't disgusted enough yet. Hate of that sin had not yet become fully ripe in my life. God then told me, You're still enjoying that thing. I protested, I do not, I hate it. He replied, Son, if you hated it enough, you'd quit. You enjoy it. That led me to ask myself in what hidden ways I might, in fact, be enjoying that sin. 
Then the Lord began to reveal mazes of subterranean lines in my heart. They were carrying hidden delights from one pocket of pus to another. If the sin was, for example, to turn silent and cold and be inattentive around my wife, Paula, behind that single simple happening were all kinds of roots. One, delights of punishing a critical mother. Two, feelings of power in getting another person's goat. Three, the wicked fascination of making another person suffer. Four, fantasies of being the noble martyr who's keeping his cool while my wife Paula, he says sarcastically, poor thing, blows her control and becomes furious, not able to be as Christian and controlled as I am. And then five, inadmissible feelings of getting even with my wife Paula. And then he goes on, and so we could catalog a nearly endless list of delights behind one simple sin, but it does not have to be that way. God changes us from the inside out by revealing these roots and then giving us the courage to take them to the cross for crucifixion. This requires faith on our part that he will resurrect the new man, a new woman, on the other side of that cross. We have to have enough faith to believe that we can let go of that old habit pattern. We recognize now that it's not healthy, but it's the only thing we know. So we have to have faith to say if we kill it, What will God do for me on the other side of that cross? Won't I feel like I'm back in kindergarten again, trying to relearn everything from scratch? That's why it takes faith. We got so used to that old behavior pattern, we trusted in it for so long that we perfected that sinful behavior. That's why it has to die. We say goodbye to that dysfunction, and then we learn the new way that he will teach us how to interact with people, not by giving them the silent treatment, but by interacting with people in a life-giving way, resolving conflicts, dealing with confrontation in a healthy way. 2 Peter chapter 1 is one of my favorite verses. Verse 3 says, His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Isn't that wonderful? Just think about it for a minute. Meditate on it. God's divine power has given to us, not some things, but all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises that through those you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So meditate on that. You have been given an ability to partake of the divine nature. Whatever things the Lord shows you through this class, if there are dysfunction, and believe me, if you don't have any, you'd be the first one (laughs) in 12 years. Whatever he shows you that needs to be dealt with, you don't have to have a crash about that. You don't have to feel terrible about yourself that there's something in there that needs to come out. That's okay. He's given us this great gift to be partakers of the divine nature. He's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's a good dad. He understands we're not perfect. And if he sees something in there and we see it that we know shouldn't be there, why wouldn't he want us to eject that thing, to pull it up from the root and get it out? And then in 2 Peter chapter 1, it says, For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Just to give a personal testimony, we planted our church in a town called Bernardsville, New Jersey. I know I said Basking Ridge earlier because that's where our church is today, but we started out in a town called Bernardsville. It's just the next town over. Back in 1999, we didn't know one person in the town, so we were praying and seeking the Lord. We started with a Tuesday night Bible study with seven people that came the first night, and thankfully today it's grown in the last 12 years wonderfully to be a healthy body of believers. But I've said often that every Christian before they die should have to either plant a church or be involved in a church plant because of the wonderful process God brings you through of learning about his love for the lost and his love for the church. And if we would do that, I think those folks who haven't been involved in a church plant or haven't actually planted a church, they would have a much greater appreciation for how difficult it is and have a greater respect for people in the ministry. So one of the creative things that God showed us to do as a young church was instead of taking our finances and saving it up to get our own building, we decided to open up a cafe in the downtown area of our town which is right across from the train station where people commute into New York City to work every day. 
And it was one of the highlights of my life to be involved in this. I say it kind of in the past tense because we've since closed it in order to be able to get our own building. But it served a wonderful purpose at its stage in our church's life to get us out in the community and meet people we never would have met that probably never would have walked through the doors of a church building, but who were a vibrant and active part of the community. And what happened was through wonderful friends that we have, one man named Ed Silvoso, another named Lance Wall now, who've written books and taught extensively about taking the church out of the four walls of the church and out into the community. We just developed a love for the lost and for these folks that would walk into our store who didn't know Genesis from Revelation, couldn't open a Bible and, and find the maps. But we knew that they needed God. And through serving them coffee and being kind to them and just allowing them to experience the love that was in us from God to pour across that counter, we saw some wonderful things happen. But we also developed a greater love for the hurting people in our community. But I didn't realize, not ever having done a cafe before, was that there are many lonely people in any community and some of them would come in our store and buy a cup of coffee and just sit in one of those chairs and be there for an hour. Long after that coffee had turned cold, they were still sitting there, and it didn't take much for us to realize that they were just very lonely people and that they didn't have a place to go back home to. So they liked being in the cafe because it was full of life and it was bustling and they could hear music and they could read a book. And they just wanted to be out from the loneliness of their lives. I mean, you think about that. Why... Wouldn't God want the church to be in the midst of that pain in the community? If anybody could minister love, it would be spirit-filled Christians who love the Lord and want to pour his love out through their lives into the lost. The way this ties into Elijah House for me was that before I really delved into the depths of this kind of material of, of seeing transformation and sanctification as such a key part of our lives, I had a bit of a judgmental attitude towards unbelievers. I didn't mean to, but this religious creep started to happen to be in my walk. But once God humbled me by showing me that even after all these years of being a Christian and even being a pastor of a church, that there were still many areas of my life that needed to be worked on, I didn't have such a hard edge towards unbelievers. I looked at them, like it says about Jesus, when he looked at the crowds, it says that he had compassion on them and saw them as sheep without a shepherd. And I hope and pray that that's what God will do for you as well, that this process isn't meant to just be introspective. Yes, you will see things in your life that have been dysfunctional and that he can correct and improve and you can grow through that. But that's towards an end. It's towards an end of creating us more in his image. And his image was that he didn't judge people. When he saw the woman who had been caught in adultery, he easily could have rejected her and agreed with the Pharisees who said, hey, she was caught right in the act. She should be stoned. Instead, he looked at her and had compassion on her. He didn't judge her. And then after they had left and they couldn't throw the first stone because none of them were without sin, he said, women, where are your accusers? She said, I don't know. They're not here. They left. And he said, well, neither do I accuse you, but go and sin no more. See, that's the principle. Freely we have received, freely we give. We get poured into by God, and then we can pour back out. And that's the essence of this class. And the essence of why we ask people that want to be in leadership to go through this material is because it humbles us in a good way and causes us to be more compassionate for people, whether they're the lost in a coffee shop or whether it's a person coming up to the altar for prayer after a church service who's just had a death in their family or who's going through a relational problem in their marriage or one of their children is a prodigal child and has been drifting away. We don't want to judge that person. We don't want to come across as the know-it-all person who's got all the answers, but we want to feel what they're feeling and empathize with them. And as God has brought us through this process of transformation and sanctification, that capacity has increased in our hearts. And I would never say we fully arrived because that, that's probably not going to happen this side of heaven. But getting closer to that place of Christ's likeness and love for hurting people is close to his heart and something he wants in all of us. To that end, I've always admired Mother Teresa. Many of you know about her ministry in Calcutta. She laid down her life for people who could never pay her back. I understand that she was a Roman Catholic, and we don't agree with all the doctrine of the Roman Catholic Church, but pretty hard to argue that she was not close to the heart of God and the ministry that she had outreaching to the lost and to the poor. And one of the quotes she said that I'll always remember was, there are no great things, only small things with great love. 
Meditate on that. There are no great things, only small things with great love. Each one of these little pieces that we're putting together, each time we get one of those cracks in our lives healed and restored and brought back to the fullness that God wanted, that may not be a big thing in and of itself, but it's a small thing that's done with great love. The Father gives us that great love to to reveal it to us and then expects us to take it back out to our families, to our children, to our extended family, to our workplace. She also said, Mother Teresa did, I'm a little pencil in the hand of a writing God who is sending a love letter to the world. Each one of these people I minister to, she said, is Jesus in disguise. And if you judge people, you have no time to love them. So I want to finish with two portions of scripture, one from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Many of you will be familiar with this portion of scripture, but you may not have ever heard it read in the Message Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 in the message says, The message that points to Christ on the cross seems like sheer silliness to those hell-bent on destruction. But for those on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. Now, my interjection is, hopefully, as you've heard this teaching today, you understand that the cross wasn't just a one-time event. As wonderful as that was when Jesus died on the cross and then was resurrected, that was the turning point of history. But he also told us that we are to take up our cross daily. Daily, not weekly, daily. Or we are supposed to take up that cross. So that's why for those of us on the way of salvation, it makes perfect sense. Back to Corinthians. This is the way God works. And most powerfully, as it turns out, it's written, I'll turn conventional wisdom on its head. I'll expose the so-called experts as crackpots. Where can you find someone truly wise and truly educated, truly intelligent in this day and age? Hasn't God exposed all of the world's knowledge as pretentious nonsense? Since the world in all its fancy wisdom never had a clue when it came to knowing God, God in his wisdom took delight in using what the world considered dumb, preaching of all things, to bring those who trust him into the way of salvation. While Jews clamor for miraculous demonstrations and Greeks go in for philosophical wisdom, we go right on proclaiming Christ, the crucified. Jews treat this like an anti-miracle and Greeks pass it off as absurd. But to us who are personally called by God himself, both Jews and Greeks, Christ is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. And if we just pause for a minute and think about how this would apply to what this teaching is about today, you're entering into a process of becoming more Christ-like. The world is always trying to creep into your daily life. There's so many forms of entertainment today, smartphones, internet connections, text messages. We're bombarded with information, and Jesus is calling out to us. Holy Spirit is speaking to us on a regular basis, saying, break through all that clutter and live your life as Christ would live it through you. That requires a commitment. That requires a process. That requires 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all iniquity and attachments and unrighteousness that tries to come on us. Christ, it says in 1 Corinthians 1, 24, is God's ultimate miracle and wisdom all wrapped up in one. Human wisdom, verse 25, human wisdom is so tinny, so impotent next to the seeming absurdity of God. Human strength can't begin to compete with God's quote-unquote weakness. Take a good look, friends, at who you were when you got called into this life. I don't see many of the best and brightest among you, not many influential, not many from high society families. Isn't it obvious that God deliberately chose men and women that the culture overlooks and exploits and abuses, chose these nobodies to expose the hollow pretensions of the quote-unquote somebodies? That makes it quite clear that none of you can get by with blowing your own horn before God. Everything that we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate and a fresh start, comes from God by way of Jesus Christ. That's why we have the saying, if you're going to blow a horn, blow a trumpet for God. That was verse 31. 
All that to say, church, as you listen to these teachings, realize the end goal is not really about your getting whole. It's about him pouring through you so that in his wonderful love for this world and for his church and for you, you can become more like him. You might be functioning fine right now. You may be going through life and saying, I don't really feel like there are any apparent issues or problems in my life. That's wonderful. You should feel very blessed by that if you can make that statement. But when you stepped into the church, you stepped into a place that's designed to be a life-giving culture, an ecosystem of life from God. And therefore, this class may be designed to help you just get greater compassion for other people's issues and other problems that they face. Maybe you had two parents in the home who loved you and gave you lots of affection and didn't judge you or put performance orientation on you or there weren't problems like alcoholism in your family. That's all wonderful. You should thank him right now. But I can tell you, that's not the general rule. Most people in the population have had very difficult problems in their lives. God is able to heal that. That's why he said he chose the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. He took the quote-unquote nobodies and he turned them into somebodies who could just turn the world's knowledge upside down. As we go out as the church and we do what he's called us to do, healthy and strong, walking in his power, willing to be people who look at what's on the inside of us and whenever there's something there that's not pleasing to him, say, Lord, I don't want it. If you don't want it in my life, I don't want it in my life. And I submit to this process of transformation and sanctification. I will end with Philippians 3. This is a classic portion of scripture. Paul is that ultimate person who was a somebody He had been a Pharisee. He had studied under one of the great priests. We learn about this in the book of Acts. His name was Gamaliel, one of these great priests, and Paul was one of his top students. So Paul had achieved the highest level of success in the Jewish priesthood in that culture. And yet he says in Philippians 3, 7, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ, meaning my position, what I had achieved, the reputation that comes with that, the ego that gets inflated through that, all those things that I used to count important, I've counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss. So not just my reputation, not just my standing in the community. I have found the pearl, and I was willing to go and sell everything I have so that I can purchase that pearl. Verse 8 again, for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ. So if you're coming through this process here with this class and God's going to ask you to lay some things down and turn back on some old resentments or some old habits that you have, don't mind that process. Don't despise that process of crucifixion and resurrection. He's a good dad. He's a good father. He wouldn't ask you to lose something unless it was something that you aren't benefiting from and unless he was going to give you something better in return. We say it often, you cannot give God. So when you take that Isaac to the altar in obedience and you say, God, I don't really understand this. I thought Isaac was the promise that you were giving me. But if you're asking me to crucify him right now, sacrifice him on the altar, I've got to believe that you're going to resurrect him back again. That's the kind of faith we need, that Abraham kind of faith. I count those old things as rubbish, Paul said, that I might gain Christ, verse 9 of Philippians 3 says, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. This was a major change for Paul. He has the revelation that it wasn't about righteousness by works any longer, but that new law was going to be the faith that we had in Christ. That is what puts us in right standing. That's what gives us the ability to turn away from all habits, to walk away from things that we trusted in, is the faith that if we crucify it, by that faith, I know if I let this thing go, because he's a good dad, he's going to give me something better back in return. He goes on to say in verse 9, the righteousness which is from God by faith, and then in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Again, that I may know him, Christ, and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now you think, well, okay, when I die, because I'm a Christian, I'm going to go to heaven. And because Jesus died on the cross, that's what purchased my salvation. And we agree, 
the blood, the most powerful influence on the planet Earth is the blood of Christ that purchased our salvation. We never could have earned that in our own strength. But if you drill down a little deeper into what Paul is saying here, it's also about while we're living. It's not just about when we die and whether our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, because he talks about the fellowship of his sufferings, the power of his resurrection, being conformed to his death. Well, you cannot have a resurrection unless you go through a crucifixion first. So when Paul says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, he's not just talking about what happens when our bodies are going to be resurrected when Christ returns. The fellowship of his sufferings is partly what we deal with in going through this kind of a course. The easy thing would be to just ignore these issues. But because God loves us so much, he says, no, I love you too much to leave you in the current state that you're in. Not that you're in such a terrible state, but you haven't optimized the place where I want you to be. I want to bring you further. I want you to be more Christ-like. John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. But part of that is the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ and being conformed to his death, taking up my cross daily in order that I might follow him. Verse 11 in Philippians 3, If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. I can promise you, if Paul could say that I have not already attained or am already perfected, then neither can we say we have already arrived and we are already in a place of completion in our lives. There is more room for us to go in our maturity. There's more room for us to be better imitators of Christ, to be more Christ-like and less flesh winning out and more spirit winning out. Less of a carnal mindset and more of a heavenly mindset, same as we read in Colossians, putting off the old man and putting on the new man. I press on, he said, that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. What has he laid hold of you for? And are you fully walking in that place? Chances are no, right? There's further that we can go. When we were in our mother's womb, there was an architectural blueprint laid into our DNA. At the moment of conception, there was a plan. Jeremiah 29, I know the plans. It's a good plan. If you're not walking it out to the fullness, not a big deal. There's still more. You can press in. We get rid of these obstacles that allows us to fully flourish and be all that he called us to be. Verse 13 of Philippians 3, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. And for Paul, that easily means forgetting the idea that I can earn my way to a better standing with God by just working harder than everybody else, by trying to follow the law better than everyone else. That's the culture that he came out of. That's the belief system and the worldview that he had. No, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Learning this new way, Paul would think, I have a hard time getting my arms around it, that it's just by faith. But I'm reaching forward to those things which are ahead, and I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I pray that for you as you listen to these CDs. I pray that as you come week in and week out to the class, that you'll have an open heart, that you'll give Holy Spirit permission to pull back the curtains on hidden things in your life. I believe you can trust that he's a gentleman, that he's a loving God, and Holy Spirit is not going to reveal things that you're not ready to handle yet. But as you give him permission and say, yes, I trust you, whatever you think I need to deal with, whatever is on your agenda right now, I give you permission to open up those places in my heart. And I know that I'm in a safe place, a king of kings. There's people around here who love me, who will pray with me, who are not going to condemn me if I admit that I've done something wrong in my life. Because all of us have realized the same things and all of us have done terrible things in our lives as well. Instead of trying to deny that and live in some kind of culture of masking those things, we want to just be transparent and honest before the Lord and say, we are all works in progress here, Lord. You have a process going on in our lives, and we gladly and openly submit to your process. So we just thank you that as we engage in this process with you over these next 12 weeks as we listen to the cds really for the rest of our lives it's not going to change you're going to still be a loving dad who's going to want to keep allowing us to move further and go farther in you 
We thank you that you give us the courage. You give us your strength through Holy Spirit to press into these issues. And then you show us where the roots are. And then we can come and bring that repentance and confession and ask for the forgiveness in any areas where we need to ask for forgiveness. But then also to be able to extend forgiveness to those people who may have hurt us and caused some trauma in our lives that's still been causing us to walk with a limp. But we say no to the enemy's plan to keep that limp in place. And we say yes to your plan to bring us to full restoration and transformation in Christ. In Jesus' name, amen.